<laughs> Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. How are we all doing, gang? Uh, first of all, a big apology for me, because I finally finished decorating and setting up my new office, which, okay, is just a spare room in my home converted into an office. But the sound is a little echoey at the moment, so please, bear with me while I try and fill it with lots of soft furnishings to take that echo sound away. And I also need to apologise, as during the setup phase... I left you guys hanging for a couple of days over the weekend with no Daily Tech podcast to listen to. But have no fear, I'm back again bombarding your podcast feeds and also playing catch-up so you may get more than one over the next few days. But I did give you a break, right? Now, we have covered so many topics lately, including everything from inshore tech, martech, edtech, the subscription economy, and so much more. But today, I want to talk about the very timely topic of biometric authentication. Uh, Earlier this month, Jumio, the global leader in online identity verification and biometric authentication, launched something called Jumio Authentication. And this new video selfie authentication tool actually enables users to verify themselves during high-risk transactions and unlock everything from their online accounts to rental cars and in the process, replacing passwords on any device. And passwords, multi-factor authentication and knowledge-based authentication are, let's be honest, no longer reliable methods. And how do we know this? Because of the ongoing breaches that fill our news feeds on a daily basis. And anything that involves killing passwords is all good with me, especially because every time I go overseas to cover a tech event, as soon as I open up my laptop, all my tools seem to ask me for a series of passwords that I can't remember. So buckle up and hold on tight so I can beam your ears all the way to San Francisco so we can speak with Jumio Chief Revenue Officer Robert Prigg who's going to discuss the impact biometric authentication is going to have and also why 2FA and KBA are slowly dying and how organisations seeking to establish a digital chain of trust with their users need to start and consider biometrics. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Sure. My name's uh, Robert Priggy. I'm the president of Jumio, uh, responsible you know, for all aspects of the company. I've been here about four and a half years or so, and I'm based out of uh, Silicon Valley in right in sunny Palo Alto, California. Fantastic. Now, for people listening and hearing about Jumio for the very first time, could you just tell me a little bit more about the kind of problems that you guys solve and how connecting a person's online and real-world identities is actually the sweet spot of Jumio? Sure. So Jumio is the way that companies establish trust remotely. So what that means is whether you're doing gaming, you know, sports betting in the UK, and you scan in your uh, ID and maybe take a selfie, um, or you're opening a, a bank account in Europe and you know, uh, scan in your passport or government-issued ID and take a selfie. We're the way that companies establish that you are who you say you are. So I virtually guarantee everyone listening to your podcast has gone through the, the Jumio process, uh, which is typically called identity verification or ID and identity verification. Uh, where you'll scan in a government-issued ID, uh, take a selfie, and then they're, they're matched to each other. And the, the real reason that we do that is it's one of the only ways to establish who you really are. Uh, a lot of people in the marketplace will ask questions about your unique, you know, in the U.S., like your social security number uh, or a driver's license number or your old address or something like that. But because uh, in the last year, account takeover is up over tenfold. It's because of, of things like a, a breaches and the fact that there is no such thing as private information anymore. Everyone's address, history, and, and other things are online and easily findable. Um, and so it's no longer good enough to just ask a question to ask who someone says they are. You need to prove who they are. And so really the business problem that we're solving um, is whether it's a sharing economy, 
you know, staying at someone else's house uh, or getting a rental car or just about anything else. Um, when you're uh, remotely signing up for a service, typically, they'll go through our process uh, to prove that you're carrying the government-issued ID, um, and then we'll, we'll match the selfie to make sure that the person holding the ID is the one taking the selfie. So really, those are the, the business problems that we're solving is letting you know who you're dealing with, not who they say they are. And this is going to be a bit of a long shot, but I was in the US recently, and when they scan, well, usually they scan your boarding pass and, and then let you through. But on this particular occasion, they said, don't scan your boarding pass. Look up to the camera. And I looked up to the camera, and straight away it went, Neil Hughes, passenger 57, on you go. Um, do you do anything like that as well? Uh, we, we do. So uh, some of the major airlines uh, will use like the, the app on their phone, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll walk you through the exact process that you're talking about. Um, and part of the reason for that is they want a great experience for the customer. Uh, and part of it is they want to make sure that you have a, a visa to get into the country that you're supposed to be going to. Uh, I myself had a flight to Singapore. I got to the airport at you know 5.30 in the morning to fly there. And um, I was two days away from my visa, you know, having enough time on it, my passport. Uh, so they wouldn't let me board the airplane, which was a pretty terrible experience for me. So a- absolutely, uh, you know, more and more companies are having you do this stuff uh, online ahead of time uh, to make sure that you are who you say you are and also to check things like visas, you know, like in the example that, that you were giving. Um, same thing, you know, uh, when you stay uh, at, someone's you know shared economy or pick up a rental car more and more you know this is just becoming the uh the standard of how people establish uh, your identity oh man missing a flight or being turned away from a flight is my absolute worst nightmare <laughs> <laughs> tell the truth did you have a diva moment there did you, did you begin raising your voice saying do you know who i am did, did that happen or did you just remain calm i i mentioned i'm friends with neil and you should <laughs> let me on this plane immediately but yeah, I, I have to say it was a terrible experience. And like I said, I was I was legitimately like two days short and I had typed in my information online. They should have known it. Uh, but, you know, th- this is the whole benefit of why airlines will do this sort of thing with us. Um, same thing, you know, uh, so it was a terrible experience. Um, and more and more, you know, this is why airlines and, and sharing economy financial FSI companies, you know, want to do something like this so that they can get ahead of it, give you a great experience, but also, you know, just know that it's you uh, when you're trying to do something and that it's not someone trying to take over your account. Now, you also recently launched Jumio Authentication, and this new video sells the authentication tool, enables users to verify themselves during high-risk transactions and unlock everything from online accounts to rental cars to replacing passwords, but on on any device. Can you expand on that? It sounds incredibly cool. Yeah, I, I got to say it is incredibly cool. <laughs> uh, you know, what, one of the big business problems that existed was um, people would sign up for a service or they'd open up a bank account or they'd you know, create their account online. And then, and that process is typically called enrollment. Um, and then at a much later date, uh, they would be asked to sign up for authentication, which is maybe your fingerprint or your voice uh, or your face or something like that. And the, the big problem is, there was a lot of uh, uh, identity theft, account takeover, um, where because you're disconnected in time, they don't actually know that the person who's registering their voice or their face is actually the person that they enroll. And so the, the business problem that we're solving is um, we're releasing, re- uh, releasing the, the first solution in the marketplace that marries and combines that enrollment process with your biometric-based authentication, um, in our case, a a face. So what happens is when you're signing up for your bank account or your shared economy site or your your gaming site, um, when you uh, create your account, you also uh, take either your phone or your webcam um, and you make a 3D face map of your face uh, by 
uh, holding the phone, you know, a foot away and then getting it a little bit closer, it gives you perspective and it, it enables you to build a, a three-dimensional face map of your face so that it's basically impossible to be spoofed. And the real benefit of that is because you're doing it at the time of enrollment and because we're matching the selfie that you're taking to your ID, we know that it's actually Neil that we're recording the face for instead of someone pretending to be him. And then that way, because we've registered it at the beginning of the process, six months later, um, when you want to transfer money to Russia suddenly, or when you want to change your uh, address, uh, or you lose your phone and you need to kind of prove that it's still you, you're able to do that because you still have the same face and the same biometrics, but we know that it was really you when you started. So the, the degree of certainty is very, very high. And really the, the big problem that impacts the consumers is um, things like forgotten passwords. Studies by Google will show that roughly 50% of the time people will forget their password a year later. Uh, so that's a large problem. People losing their phones. Uh, or, frankly, bad actors like identity theft or um, account takeover, where someone wants to hack into your account. If it's just something simple like a password, it's very easy to break, but no one else has your face. And so this 3D face mapping technology is extraordinarily sophisticated and dependable. Uh, again, whether it's on your Android phone or your uh, Apple uh, or even your, your web-based interface, um, you're able to build the 3D face map, which builds a, a great experience for the consumer, and it makes it very frustrating for the fraudster because they basically can't do anything. It's almost impossible for them to pretend to be you uh, and make any modifications to your account. So it's a, it's a huge quantum leap forward in the, in the technology. Now, killing the password is obviously going to be music to everyone's ears, but doing that is so much more than just convenience. So can you expand on why passwords are no longer reliable methods as a result of these ongoing data breaches that we're seeing on an almost daily basis now, aren't we? Yeah, no, I mean, like you said, uh, the, the data breaches are, are practically a daily occurrence at this point. Um, in February, you know, there was news around 620 million accounts that went on sale on the dark web. Uh, just the other day, another 127 million records uh, from eight companies got put on the dark web. Um, and, and so there is no such thing as private information anymore. You know, it's almost all public. Uh, and especially for people who are reusing, you know, the, the same password at multiple different sites, if any of them get breached, you know, now people have access to all of the sites where you had made that uh, available. So um, it, there's not only the, the data breaches, um, there, there's also, you know, as I mentioned previously in this uh, call, uh, how people are forgetting uh, their passwords all their time, uh, or they're changing their phones, or it's tied to an old email address that they don't really have access to anymore. Uh, so it can be extremely frustrating for people so ultimately, you know, while passwords uh, have been very effective, um, they're increasingly less and less reliable. Um, people are, are using more and more tools uh, that help them with them. Uh, but nevertheless, this is why the, the future is biometrics. Um, that they used to say uh, for authentication or, or proving who you are, it was, you know, something you have something you are, something you know, increasingly something you know has no value because everything can be found out by just simply Googling it or looking on the dark web. So it goes to something that you have, which is something like your cell phone, uh, and something that you are, which is your biometric. In our case, uh, it's a 3D face map that we use for authentication. Uh, it can also be your voice. It can be your fingerprint and other things. Uh, but nevertheless, biometrics are, are the future of how people are going to be proving who they really are over the next several years. Um, passwords are not going to die in the next 30 days. Uh, and yet, I, I think more and more people recognize the inherent weaknesses they have. 
uh, and are certainly going to be migrating to biometrics more and more, especially when it's a transaction that has some sort of value associated with it. Accessing your, your bank account um, or signing up for your gaming account or scheduling a sharing economy where you stay at someone else's house. Um, you know, there's real money at, at play there. There's physical danger for people. And so it's important uh, that they know who you are and, and that you know who they are. Now we, we might not be able to guarantee that passwords are going to disappear in 30 days, but I think we can guarantee that we'll be pestered to be updated or changing them within 30 days. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I, I think what, what's going to happen more is it, it might be the way that you get into the site. Um, but when you try to do something sensitive, there'll be a security challenge of some sort, um, you know, whether it be an uh, SMS message or a 3D face map of you or, or some other biometric based thing when you do something large or something that has value. So it, they might still let you in through the front door with a password. Uh, but when you get into the more sensitive areas of your account, that's probably where biometrics are going to play a more and more mandatory uh, part. Now, for the people listening all over the world, I'm sure they've all read stories about using an image to unlock a phone that was biometric locked or even creepily unlocking a partner's phone while they're sleeping. I mean, can we put some of those myths to bed that things have moved on a little since then? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll neither confirm nor deny my wife opening my phone <laughs> using my fingerprint, uh, which uh, she did one time. But the what the sorts of biometrics that we're talking about, um, increasingly, you know, that's a practical impossibility. Um, something like a fingerprint is just, you know, putting someone's finger on the sensor. Uh, but these uh, 3D face maps, in the way that I'm talking about it, um, basically, they're little movies that are taken, if you really think about it. They sense whether or not your eyes are open. Uh, they can even sense if it's a rubber mask or not. It, it's really amazing. You know, we're, we're certified at a, a level within NIST, uh, N-I-S-T, that the, the level of security is such that even if the person was helping you, and sat still and let you make a plastic rubber mask of their face, you still wouldn't be able to trick it. So it's incredibly sophisticated. And, you know, even the Mission Impossible masks would be caught, you know, by this technology, which is just amazing. And so what what happens is uh, an important concept called liveness detection. And a lot of these different areas uh, that we're talking about um, are looking for, are your eyes blinking? You know, are you moving your, your head around or not? As you move the camera, you know, towards you, uh, are there movements? Are you basically alive? And so it's not just, is it matching that the faces or the biometrics are the same? It's also testing that you're a live human being um, and that you're not a you know, statue or that you're not a video recording of someone doing the same thing, you know, because the fraudsters uh, get more and more sophisticated, uh, we as vendors get more and more sophisticated as well. Uh, And that's why, you know, we're able to do this liveness detection that's actually uh, taking hundreds of of still frame photos uh, and looking to confirm that you're alive as well as building out this 3D map of your face uh, so that it can map uh, your face. And what kind of impact do you think that biometric authentication is going to have in the near future, just to help people visualize the kind of changes that are coming? Absolutely. So it, it, even you know a year or two ago, there were not that many places online or in your, on your phone where you would be scanning in your ID and your uh, your face. And in the last two or three years, you know, partly through Jumia's leadership, but also the industry as a whole, um, it's now become table stakes for uh, just about everyone as they go online and consume services. So I, I really think in the same way that, you know, a year or two ago, people weren't as used to scanning in their ID. I think in the next year, people will become very, very used to creating these kind of like face maps 
uh, or registering their voice or doing other biometrics. And the, the reason that I say that is, number one, it creates a great experience for the customer. It's very simple. You know, there's not three screens of questions that you have to answer what your dog's favorite food was uh, or some of these silly things. It, it's really just you. And a year later and two years later, when you're going to use that service, you don't need to remember what your password was. You don't need to remember or have not lost a unique code they gave you. You're still going to have your own face. Um, and, you know, this top technology learns and grows over time so that even if you grow a beard over the next two years, that's fine. It'll, you know, still be able to recognize you. So I'm supremely confident that for the regular consumer, it's going to change your life when it comes to picking up rental cars. Um, I, I think that you're going to do it, you know, via your phone. And instead of showing your ID to someone on the way out the door, your app will have taken care of that. So there, there won't be those gates anymore. Um, I think it's going to change people's lives when it comes to things like hotels. Uh, you should be able to just kind of check in and um, use your uh, phone to unlock the door when you need to by just scanning your, your face. Um, you're going to be using it at uh, things like uh, banks or uh, financial institutions. When you make a large transfer and they want to prove that it's really you, uh, I think you'll do it. So I virtually guarantee in the next year, people are going to be recording their biometrics much more frequently than they, they have in the last 18 months. So there's going to be a lot of people listening that are using two-factor authentication at the moment. I mean, do you think the future looks bleak for 2FA, in your opinion? I think it really depends on what kind of two-factor authentication you're talking about. Um, if you think about it in some ways, uh, what we do is effectively two-factor authentication because you're using your government-issued ID, which you have, and your biometric, which you are. Um, but many of the other flavors uh, or the most common factors are, are not uh, very reliable or secure. Um, one of the most popular uh, is what's called KBI, KBA. Um, that's where they're asking a question about where you used to live uh, or your mother's maiden name or, or things like that. And as I've mentioned many times, thanks to all of the countless breaches, um, that's where that data um, is virtually useless uh, or increasingly useless because so many people can have access to it. Um, so things like, like KBA, knowledge-based authentication, uh, of qu questioning you about something you know are increasingly unreliable and you know, not terribly valuable. The other kind is SMS-based two-factor authentication where they'll send a four or a six-digit code to your phone. Um, again, these are very vulnerable to phishing attacks or man-in-the-middle attacks, uh, as well as many other exploits. And, and so increasingly, I, I think when it comes to something of value, it's going to be biometrics, uh, which are virtually unspoofable, uh, that's going to lead the way. So I, I think, in, in my opinion, it'll take a while for um, two-factor authentication to diminish. It, it is quite cheap, uh, which is why people do it, but it's also you know, quite valueless, which is why it's cheap to do it that way. Because really, you know, they're, they're using the same data that almost everyone else has. So I, I think it's going to greatly diminish over the next 12 to 24 months. And for any business leaders that are listening, thinking of how can they implement this kind of technology into their business, do you have any use cases of how organizations are seeking to establish that digital train of trust with their users and, and why they're turning to biometrics and the kind of results that they're having? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And I, I think um, before I go into specific verticals, um, I, I think it's actually much harder to come up with a business who doesn't need to do this sort of stuff by going online uh, than it is to, to name who does need to do it. And the reason that I say that is um, digital transformation or companies going online with their business is by far and away the, the largest trend and the biggest disruption going on in the world. And as companies do that, the number one problem that they immediately run into is trust and knowing who they're dealing with and knowing six months later if they're still dealing with the same person. 
And so the, the use cases that we see um, are all over the map. So already we've discussed how this is going to change the way you pick up your rental car. Um, already, you know, this is pretty much the standard uh, within FSI. So um, if you buy cryptocurrency, you absolutely, you know, went through this process. Um, if you ever do gaming uh, or, or gambling online, you'll go through this process, opening a bank account. Uh, but there, there's, uh, we talked about uh, when you fly on an airplane. Um, but even, you know, in, in America, we'll do things like garage sales where you'll sell, uh, you know, something that's in your own house. Um, well, people meet each other when they're selling and there's the threat of physical violence. So they'll go through a, a process like ours to make sure that they know who people are. They're sharing economy, you know, whether it be uh, cars or staying at someone's houses or even the rental bikes. All of those now use this process. And so I, I think ultimately the question for your listeners is um, how and when do they want to know the identity of their consumer? Um, it might be you know, when you're onboarding them, you record all of this information. Um, but yeah, are you a marketplace and you want to make sure that all of your customers know they're in a safe environment and that everyone's been checked out? Are you a dating site um, and you want to make sure that you've got people's credentials in case of physical violence? Um, are you uh, opening up a, a, a small business um, and you want to give people the ability six or 12 months later to add other people onto their account or to change the address. Again, this is a great way for someone to prove who they are uh, as a security challenge for you to change it. So I, I think ultimately as everyone goes online, um, trust is going to be an important part of their business, but it's really how do they use it? Do they want to use it to get rid of the password and just use their face to log in? Do they want to use it as a security challenge? Or do they just want to, to use it to make sure that they know other people aren't doing bad things with their account? In the U.S., there was a very famous example where one of the banks had their employees um, uh, so worried about their commission checks that the uh, the employees would actually go in and create new accounts for the customers because they were paid on how many new customer accounts they created. Well, in the case where you're scanning in their face, you can't do that, right? Um, and, and so in a lot of ways, this sort of technology is great for the consumer. Uh, it's great for the business because you know who you're dealing with. Um, and it's a, a great experience overall because it's it's so simple and is just taking a picture of your face instead of remembering complex passwords or typing in screens worth of information. Now, you guys have already had a fantastic start to the year here in 2019, but is there anything else that you can share with us about the future of biometric security and indeed Jumio? Uh, sure, uh, absolutely. Obviously, you know, these are the early days. Uh, a lot of our offerings around uh, authentication were just launched earlier this year where we were the first that was tying the um, identity verification uh, up with the authentication component. Um, I anticipate we'll be releasing, we, we just released uh, PEPs and sanctions screenings as well as part of that onboarding uh, for you to be able to kind of check out the background of the people that you're working with. Um, more and more, uh, this is going to be the way companies compete is on experience, uh, that when you go online, people are not going to be impressed by the architecture of your building or how many people are working at the checkout register. They're going to be impressed by how smooth the process is. And ultimately, I think that's where they're going to choose companies like Jumio that make it really slick and easy but secure to interact with their consumers. I think that these are now the table stakes in the digital economy. Um, and it's, it's really, over the last one or two years, I think a lot of businesses have had the faith in them eroded. You know, that consumers are more and more cynical about whether or not they can trust who they're dealing with. Uh, and I think um, instituting things like this kind of authentication, like this kind of onboarding, helps those companies regain that trust 
um, and you know build a, a better company and a better experience for the consumer. And I'm conscious we've covered a lot of ground today. So before I let you go, could I just ask that you remind the listeners of where they can find out more information about Jumio online and maybe even contact a member of your team if they are left with any questions? Absolutely. The, the easiest way to get a hold of Jumio is at jumio.com. Uh, the name originally comes from Just Use My Identity Online, J-U-M-I-O. Uh, so go to jumio.com. Uh, we've got uh, uh, emails uh, that, that can be reached out to us uh, or offices all over the world, uh, whether it be in, in uh, Asia Pacific, uh, Europe, London, uh, or the U.S. So feel free to reach out. We, we'd love to have your business. Um, and uh, appreciate you and your listeners uh, giving me your time today. Uh, also, before I let you go, there's one final question for myself. I need you to solve a first world problem for me because I was recently on holiday, sitting in the sun, drinking cocktails on the beach, living the dream, um, but my iPhone wouldn't unlock wearing my sunglasses. So every time I wanted to look at my phone, I had to <laughs> lift my sunglasses up. Can you sort that out for me? <laughs> I can connect you with Apple technical support if you, if you want. Uh, yeah, in their case, the, the way that they use the technology uh, you know, basically, uh, it inhibits their sensors when you have things like uh, uh, sunglasses on. So that's a, a well-known uh, problem that they have. Uh, but I'm happy to join you on the beach if you want to reproduce <laughs> it for me. <laughs> I will hold you to that. We'll, uh, cocktails on me. We'll, uh, we'll carry this conversation off in, in the sunshine by the <laughs> ocean. <laughs> so thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Neil. Most modern businesses do not know with any kind of certainty that the person creating a new online account or logging into an existing account is the person that they're claiming to be. And this is where Jumio Authentication is providing a solution. And my big takeaway from today's conversation is that the impact biometric authentication is going to have and why two-factor authentication and KBA are slowly dying. And of course, how organisations seeking to establish a digital chain of trust with their users need to start and think about biometrics and how it could help their business too. But as this topic affects each and every one of us, because let's face it, I think we've all would love an alternative to remembering 82 case sensitive passwords that must be at least eight characters in length, have two special characters and have at least three capital letters. We'd all like to see that go away. But does biometric authentication delight or concern you? I want to hear both sides of the argument for purpose of debate. So let's let's do that and let's try and learn a thing or two from each other. So please email me techblogwriter at outlook.com. Go to my website techblogwriter.co.uk if you'd like to find out more information about today's guest. And if you want to reach me on social media, you can get me on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Just look for Neil C. Hughes. I do look forward to hearing from you on this one, as I do every episode. It doesn't have to be about that either. It can just be where you listen to this podcast. So now I'm all set up, you can guarantee I'll be here the same time tomorrow with another guest and we'll tackle another industry and how technology is transforming it. So a big thank you for listening and until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.